Everyone in this room has a deep connection to this great university. What I'd like to do tonight is inspire you by teaching you a little bit about the work that's going on in our laboratories at Duke right now on brain cancer, and also to make it a little personal. I want to start by asking everybody to look to their left and look to their right. You probably remember when you started college and they told you to do that because one of you wouldn't graduate. Everybody has that experience. I don't understand that because we all did. But what if I told you that one of you was going to die of cancer? Or one of your children was going to die of cancer? Or your grandkids were going to die of cancer? The truth is that cancer still kills. It took both of these great men from us on exactly the same day, just a few years apart. We have to start thinking differently about cancer. And what being at Duke has allowed me to do is to start thinking differently about cancer. And I want you to start thinking about cancer as a Darwinian process, an evolution. We all start with about 50 trillion cells in our body. Some of us end up with a few more. But we start with 50 trillion cells, and they all have exactly the same DNA. But over time, mistakes are made. A few mistakes, subtle mistakes, probably only five out of about a billion pieces of DNA. But eventually, one cell develops this sinister advantage, this ability to evolve and to continue to divide. But I think our focus is in the wrong place. For years, we've been treating patients with poisons that sort of stop the cells from dividing. And I think as a result, patients lose their appetite, they lose their hair, and I think their dignity. At Duke, we started to think differently about cancer. We've started to look past the cell division and really look at these changes in the DNA that I think produce a fingerprint which allows us to target these cells very specifically and very potently. And what we've done in my laboratory is take that information and use it to try to activate the immune system so that the immune system can attack these cells in a very potent way. But the immune system's smart. It's difficult to trick. So we took two approaches. The first thing we did was we took the very protein that's created by these changes in the DNA, and we made that protein in the laboratory, and we gave it to patients. But the problem is, the immune system ignores things when they're at low levels, and it also ignores things when they're at high levels. So we had to develop another trick. And that trick was that we used things that the immune system already hates, things like tetanus or polio. And we combined that with these proteins to really signify to the immune system that we wanted it to attack these proteins. And that's the kind of technology that we're developing at Duke today. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that we can get published just this week in journals like the New England Journal of Medicine, some of the top journals in our field, or Nature, or be on 60 Minutes. But that's not really all that important. What's really important is people like Amy, a flight attendant. Amy had just won a beauty contest. She had just gotten married, and she'd just been told she had a brain tumor. Can you imagine having that sort of upward trajectory and hitting a wall? We decided that we would try something new, something developed at Duke. So we gave Amy one of these vaccines. And within three months, the abnormality on her scan was a little better, probably a fluke. But in nine months, it was gone. This is Amy today. When she first came to my office, she said to me, can I have children? At some level, she must have known that people with this disease die within a year. And she naively sat there and asked me that question. This is her children today. Every year now, she sends me a Christmas card that looks just like this on the front, and on the inside it says, I'm glad you were wrong. <laughs> I am too. And then there's Ryan, an entrepreneur from St. Louis. He was a professional golfer, played soccer in college. His business in St. Louis was thriving. He had everything. And then he had a seizure. 
And then he had an MRI, and then he had a brain tumor, and it was a big one, and it was a bad one, the worst kind. So can you imagine the courage for Ryan to fly halfway across the country, to be injected with something we didn't know what it would really do to him, to trust in us that we had hope too, that it might save his life? Well, this is Ryan today and his family. He's also survived 15 years with this tumor that should have killed him in a year. The choice to come to Duke for me was clear. Who wouldn't want to come to a place that has this much? I showed up here in 1989 in the fall in a green suit. Not, not lime green, it wasn't that bad. More <laughs> olive, uh, but in fairness, uh, it was still green. It was very popular actually in Canada. People don't believe me, but that's where I'm from. Uh, but I met this gentleman, Bob Wilkins, an icon of neurosurgery. It was a dream come true for me. But more importantly, I met his wife, Gloria, and she and her daughter, Betsy, are in the audience tonight, and they took me into their home. So that first Thanksgiving, which was really bizarre to me because Thanksgiving in Canada is not real Thanksgiving, I've learned now, I got to go to their home. They took me in. And that relationship has continued to this day. This weekend, I got the opportunity to sit courtside with Mike Wilkins, who's part owner, it turns out, of the Golden State Warriors. And I got to see, within a yard of the players, the second best basketball team in this country play. <laughs> There's not a day that goes by that I don't look at my letterhead and want to make that family proud. I've had a lot of opportunities here at Duke that I would not have had at other places. I got to work with Daryl Bigner, the undisputed father of the entire field of neuro-oncology. And I got to work with the dynamic duo, Alan and Henry Friedman, of our famous Preston Robert Tisch brain tumor program. But I also get the chance to work with people like Bob Lefkowitz and mentor very talented young individuals like Peter Fecci, who, and I'm going to tell you something that no one else knows, recently discovered why it is that patients with brain tumors are so profoundly immunosuppressed. It turns out that when you have something in your brain, it sends a signal to all of your white blood cells to hide out in the bone marrow. No one ever knew that. For 50 years, we've known that patients with brain tumors were as immunosuppressed as patients with AIDS. And it took this lineage to discover why. And I wonder, what will Peter's lab discover next? What person will he train? And what will they discover here at Duke? And I wonder where this legacy of innovation, this path of discovery will lead and whose life it will change next. The great thing about Duke for me is that every day I get to come to work and think what's next. And, you know, recently I've been thinking that this idea of vaccines, maybe we shouldn't be using them to treat patients that already have cancer. Maybe we should be a little bit more proactive. Could we use these vaccines to treat our children or our grandkids before they get cancer and stop this evolutionary process in its tracks? Wouldn't it be just really cool to do that? I wonder if we could do that. I wonder if the next time you look to your left and look to your right, no one will die of cancer. Wouldn't it be just cool to be part of that? Well, I can tell you, if you're part of Duke, you are part of that. So thank you. <laughs>